in today's video, I'm going to share with you my 10 favorite watercolor background techniques. Now, there are many, many techniques that you can do in the background of a watercolor. Perhaps you've painted some flowers or something like that. Now, you may also have had the experience of messing up a painting by putting a background in. And I have seen this many times with my students, so I do caution against sort of randomly thinking, oh, perhaps this would look better with a background of just chucking something in without thinking. But the, some of the techniques I'm gonna show you today will actually sort of recover that painting for you because some of them will cover other techniques and I'm just doing my 10 favorite ones today. So you may have tried to put, you know, a flat wash, a flat area of color behind your subject and um, found that that's quite difficult because it's actually really difficult to get a flat wash around a complex subject. I'm gonna show you how to do it at the end of this video and give you some tips for that. But I'm also going to go through some of my favorite techniques that are really, really forgiving, especially for beginners because they're going to allow you to have drying lines, marks, all sorts of fun things going on and it's still going to look really lovely, so let's get started. So there are many ways to do a wet into wet background. We're going to look at two of them in this video, and the first one is going to be a smoothly blended wet into wet technique. So as I paint these little sample pieces, I've just drawn some hearts on them just to give me something to go around. As I paint these, be aware that if I were working on a proper large background, I would certainly be working on stretched paper. This is just cheap practice paper and I've just pinned it at the edges. But when you're throwing a lot of water onto your backgrounds, having stretched paper or a block will really help if you don't know how to stretch paper. I'll leave a link to a really simple video in the description. And we're going to start our wet into wet background. Now I'm putting a little bit of water on my brush, but I'm not actually pre-wetting the paper. Now beginners pre-wet paper, you know, far too much. Although you need to do that sometimes, a lot of the time all you're doing really is just, you know, diluting your paints and making your colors less strong. So let's put this round here. Now you see that bleeding there, that tells me I've got a little bit of um, uneven water levels. I'm just gonna rinse and dry my brush a little bit. And what I want to do is keep all of these areas to the same level of wetness and keep them moving. So I'm kind of doing both sides at once. Now it's always more difficult when you've got to sort of go around something. So I've made it a little bit harder for myself here. And you can always adjust your subject a little bit so that you've got sort of a stop and start position. Let's try a different color. I'm just using up paints that I've already got out in palettes today and I'm coming around here. And what we're trying to do is get the colors so they blend nicely, but we don't, you know, lose individual colors. And I think we'll go back to yellow around this side. Just going to dry my brush here on a cloth because we don't want puddles with this. We just want colors bleeding one into another. What I'll do with each of these samples as well is I'll let them dry so that you can see how they dried. Just patching this bit up here. You do have to be careful going back in areas you've already worked in. You may need to sort of keep going across so that you even out the water levels. And we'll let this one dry. So here's our result when it's dry. I'm really very happy with this. Now be aware that watercolor dries lighter than when you apply it, which is why I don't pre-wet the paper when doing this technique. But if you do find yours has dried too light, there's absolutely nothing to stop you from putting a layer on top and doing the whole thing again. You can also, of course, work on top of here with further techniques and further shapes. For background number two, we're going to do wet into wet again, but have you ever started doing this and found that suddenly you get some kind of weird starburst in the background or a drying line? Let's do that on purpose. So if this starts happening, you can kind of make the most of it and just go with it and have lots of these things going on in the background. It's a really pretty interesting effect. So we're gonna start the same with this one, but what we want to do this time is manipulate the water levels so that we do actually get drying lines and we get some back runs happening. They're sometimes called cauliflowers or blooms. And so we're gonna start in the same way going round. And it may be that you'd plan to do that first type of background and then it all started going wrong. And so you can kind of almost disguise things by going into this second type of background. Now it starts out looking exactly the same, but what I'm going to do periodically is I'm gonna go back over where I first started and drop wetter paint in and we're going to allow some bleed lines to happen. 
So blooms and bleeds happen when wetter paint hits damp paint. So if wet paint hits dry paint, you know, it won't go anywhere. But if wet paint hits damp paint, it will spread out. So as we come around here, I'm going to just stop and go back with wetter paint and drop in. And you can take it as far as you want. You see, if it starts to dry like this bit here, it won't spread at all. So it's a matter of timing. And we're keeping moving up here. Been a little bit inaccurate with my painting around here. But you know what? Sometimes it's better to be fast than accurate. You do have to work fairly quickly. Like I said, I've made things a little bit hard for myself here by picking a shape that is isolated in a little island. And again, I'll go back around here. It's nice to use a contrasting colour. You can do this more than once. You can allow it to start drying again and go back in. You can also, if you want to, use clean water. So I can take clean water into these areas. And what we're doing now is we're ending up with something that's a lot more sparkly. And of course, you can disguise quite a lot of mistakes this way. So remember, all you have to do is go back into damp paint with wetter paint and you can continue to manipulate this and this will continue to develop as it dries. I'm going to put a little more clean water on it and then let it dry and we'll look at it after it's dried. And here's our result after drying. So you can see that it continues to develop and things continue to happen. I've actually used this technique sometimes and then gone in and sort of made things out of the shapes. You might see a leaf in there or something like that. It's a really good basis. It's also fantastic if you just can't ever get a smooth, neat background. I particularly like this area down here. Technique number three is something I use a lot with florals and garden paintings, and that's what I call hint of landscape. So we're just going to give the impression that there might be a sky and there might be some greenery behind without painting anything specific. It's actually another version of the wet into wet, but we're going to use specific colours and it's really, really easy to do. So let's bring another colour in. I've got some cerulean here. It's a little bit weaker and more delicate. And what I'm going to do this time is start by putting clean water across the top because I want to get kind of an effect of there possibly being some clouds in the background. Now you could do the blue right across the top, almost in the way that we did just now. But equally, you can pop some blue in and leave some white spaces so that we get the idea that there might be clouds in the background. Now, in this case, my shape is white, so I probably want to, you know, take some blue all the way around so that it shows up. But of course, if you're using, you know, if you've got something like red flowers or something, you don't have to worry about going right up to them. In fact, it might be an advantage not to. So just judge by your subject what you want to do. Forgive my inaccurate painting. Um, I have to kind of, I can't turn my paper and my hand around while I'm filming on YouTube. Now, as I come down the bottom here, what I'm going to do is start going in with some yellow and just allowing this to mix with the blue. Now, certainly you could use ready mix greens, but you don't have to. You can just use the color that you're already using and then add a bit of yellow to it. It'll turn green on the paper. Let's grab a little bit of darker green here as well. So this is a ready mix green. I'm not sure which green this is. It's from an old palette. It could be some sap green. I'm gonna pop that in there. We can add more blue, maybe a warmer yellow. And just like the previous two examples, you can choose whether you sort of have a fairly blended effect or go for some little starbursts of interest. You can even, if you're very careful, manipulate the idea of perhaps some flowers growing in the background. Let's leave this to dry and see how it looks. So here's our initial result. And I say initial result because I would be inclined to work further in. If I was using this technique in a painting, I would tend to put, you know, on a second layer, I might put some cloud shadow in. I might also make some stronger sort of leaf shapes or something down here. Or maybe it would be, um, you know, I'd paint some branches or some stems over the top. This hint of landscape is great for if you've done something like a flower painting and you feel like it needs something in the background, but you're not sure what this always works. 
for technique number four, we're going to do a vignette background. So a vignette, and you may have seen photographs like this, is where you get a sort of a soft glow around everything and it fades out to nothing. So we're going to fade our vignette out to white paper. There are several different ways of doing this. And if this technique interests you and you want to take it a little bit further, I have a video about several ways. I think there's four different ways of doing a vignette. I'll link that one in the description of this video. First of all, let's look at how to do a basic vignette. So for this one, we're going to need two jars of water. They're off camera, but you'll still see how I use them. So what we're going to do here is we're gonna put clean water right across the background and then add some color in a blush just around the edge. Now, if you're working on a small area like this, you could possibly do that in one sweep. If you're working in a much larger area, you'll want to work from one side to the other. And what we'll do is we'll start gradually adding more water. So I'm going to go here with my clean water. So you're looking to saturate, but you're not looking to leave puddles. So we're gonna go part of the way round. Let's grab some of this cobalt violet. You need to take the water at least twice as far as you're taking the paint. You see we get this starburst effect here. That just means the paint's a little wetter, so it's traveling more. You can even out the water levels and get rid of that or keep it as you like. So I'm gonna rinse my paintbrush and then I'm going to take the clean water further round. Now, because this shape goes all the way round, in this case, I'm going to work both sides at once. But if you've just got an area, say above an object, you can just go from one side to the other. Like I said, if it's a tiny object, you can sweep around it in one go, but the water will dry quickly. And so this just gives you a little bit more time and we're going next to the object with our paint. I'll come here as well. Now I'm keeping this quite simple with one color, but you can of course do multiple colors and effects. I'll link my longer video on vignettes in the description of this one. I'm just going to finish painting around here. Let's do this last bit in one go. You see why I have two jars now so that I've always got clean water that's not lilac. See if I can paint this one a little bit neater than the last one. Now I'm trying to go in with paint that's fairly thick and sticky. The drippier and wetter it is, the more it will travel outwards. So you can control the paint by going in with slightly thicker paint. Doesn't really matter if you're using tubes or pans. You can get a similar effect. Let's leave this to dry. So here's our vignette after drying. I do have a little bit of back run stuff going on here. Now, I don't mind that at all, but what will have happened is that a puddle will have formed in the water around the outside, likely because I wasn't working on stretched paper. You can not only put this in just because you think it looks pretty, but you can also use it to drop shadow behind objects. For instance, if you're painting a white rose, you don't want a background in your painting, but there's one or two petals that just don't show up. A tiny, delicate blush of something like a light gray will just bring that petal forwards. This is a great technique. Now do remember that none of the backgrounds I'm showing you today have to be used in a single layer or alone. You can layer them up. You can also combine them. And the one I'm going to show you now, it will pretty much cover everything. So if you've really messed up your watercolor background, let's do a flat gouache background on top. Or you can just use this if you want a really flat background. As I said, I'm going to show you how to do this in watercolor later on, but it is a little tricky. So let's try doing it in gouache, which is designed to give flat, opaque color. So what if you've tried one of those backgrounds and you've completely messed it up? I'm about to mess this up by dripping on the paper, aren't I? What if you've completely messed your background up or you want to cover something up or you just want a background that's really flat and opaque? So we're going to use some gouache here. Gouache is opaque watercolor, sometimes called designer's gouache because it's what they use to get flat backgrounds on advertising work long before the invention of things like Photoshop. I actually have artists in my family who worked as what they used to call paste up artists when they used to hand paint things and use Letraset lettering. Now, unlike watercolor, it takes a lot of water and it kind of, um, it's hard to explain, but you'll feel like you've put more paint out than actually exists because it's very, very chalky. So what we'll do now is we'll just start painting. And you want to make sure, what I'm saying is mix up enough. You're gonna feel like you've mixed up enough and then you're gonna run out halfway around. So I'm putting this on fairly thickly here. 
Now you can water it down. I'll show you, you know, you can make it more lightweight. And depending on what color you're using, if you're trying to cover up a previous layer of watercolor, first of all, make sure that watercolor is dry. And then you might find that you need to put several coats on in order to cover up the previous stuff. So if you're covering up a previous layer that you're unhappy with, what I would do rather than put it on too thickly is I would go on with sort of several layers. So I'd paint one layer on, allow it to dry and then pop another layer in. Now watercolor dries lighter. Gouache is a little unusual because it sometimes dries darker, but it kind of depends on the color. So if you've got very dark color gouache like black, you'll probably find it dries a bit lighter because of the chalky nature of it. But if you have a lighter color like this, you'll probably find it dries darker. It's a fantastic medium. It's not great at layering. Now we can layer one color like this, but if you're actually painting in it alone as a medium, then it does tend to, um, underneath layers tend to lift because they don't sink into the paper as much as watercolor. If you're interested in gouache, I do have some other videos. I've got a video all about how to use it. And I also have videos comparing it to watercolor and acrylics. Now, normally if I came back round like this and this area here was already dry with watercolors, I'd be getting all sorts of drying lines, but I'm not really worried about that with this because gouache is designed to dry flat. Now it does have a very different look to watercolor. It's not as bright and reflective, and yet in its own way, it has a beautiful softness to it. I'll link to one or two other gouache videos I've got in the, uh, in the description of this video. We can already see it changing color and going a little darker. Let's let it dry and see how flat it goes. So here's the gouache after it's dried. It's gone a little darker. I am filming the following day, so the light will be different as well. It's morning now, so it's likely to be a bit brighter in here, but I think you can see that it's dried fairly flat. I do have a little bit of lightness in this area. As I said, you can just put another layer on top if you need it to be completely opaque. And you can see that it has this much more matte, chalky look than standard watercolor. Can actually be a nice contrast to put a flat matte background behind a more nuanced watercolor painting. I really enjoy using gouache. So we're halfway through and just before we jump into our next five background techniques, can I quickly just ask you if you don't mind just to press the thumbs up, press the like button. If you like, subscribe, share or leave me a comment, the YouTube algorithm will push this out to more people. I also want to encourage you to grab a channel membership. You'll find details of that in the video description, or you can just click the join button below. All of these things help me to teach more people how to paint and draw. I'm so grateful to all of you who watch me here on YouTube. Background number six is one of the ones that I use most often. In fact, I think it's one of the most popular watercolor backgrounds that exist, and that is the salt technique. I do have a longer video all about this technique if you like the look of this. Remember, results with this do vary. So don't feel that you've got something wrong if you don't get those beautiful little sort of starbursts happening. It really does depend on all sorts of things that are really outside of your control, like humidity and room temperature. But you know what? I enjoy this background, whatever happens. So let me show you how it's done. So we're going to go back in with watercolor and this time we're going to use some sea salt like this. And I'm going to do it with a wet into wet technique just because it gives it, you know, the more colors you use, the more interest there'll be on this. There are a few things that make the salt technique work well. First of all, I like to apply it to very wet paint. So I'm going to sprinkle some of this in and then I'll carry on painting round. We're going to adjust that bit in a moment because there are things we can do to increase how it works. Now with any texture technique like this one, the more granulating colors you use, the better. So if you don't know what granulating colors are, they are pigments that naturally have larger pieces in. And so you'll see more texture as they go on the paper. So we're starting out not too dark here. I'm using kind of a combination between ordinary and granulating colors. I'm going to pop some others in in a moment though. Just get this salt on before everything dries. So try to add it a little unevenly. You know, you don't want to evenly space it out. Having them in clumps looks quite nice. 
I'm now going to put some extra colors in while it's still wet. What I want is some granulating color. So I think this one here is cobalt. This is a very old palette. I'm trying to use these up actually. And see how we've got some little marks appearing already on those ones. I'm going to just drop in some other color here. And what I'm doing is I'm encouraging uneven drying and I'm adding a color in cobalt that I know granulates. We can also go into areas where we haven't got any salt and make it a little bit more interesting there too. Now, sometimes this dries with pretty starbursts. I can see them appearing here already. Other times you'll just end up getting almost like little random square shapes. Despite the fact that I'm usually very good at manipulating watercolour and getting exactly what I need from it, honestly, I've never found a way of completely controlling the salt technique. As I said, it's going to depend a lot on your localised conditions such as temperature and humidity. I'm pretty happy with how that's looking. I'm going to allow it to dry. And by allow it to dry, I'm not talking about 20 minutes. I'm talking about probably tomorrow. So here's our salt technique dried. This has actually dried overnight and I couldn't be happier with this result. This is actually a really good result. It doesn't always go as well as this. We've not only got these beautiful little shapes here, we've also got some of these starbursts that sometimes happen and sometimes don't. And because I've used some granulating colors, we've got really, really interesting texture techniques. There are so many uses for this background. You can put it in just because it looks pretty, but you can also use it for things like ice crystals or lichen on rocks. Background number seven is a really clever technique using masking tape. Now, if you've tried to put masking tape around the outside of your painting, you may have found it's not very effective. You know, the paint kind of gets under the edge. We're going to use that to our advantage. I'm not gonna say I invented this technique, but I do have a background in printmaking and it's kind of a resist technique. I think it's really effective and really beautiful. Let me show you how it's done. So just to show you how much the paper will warp when it dries, this is why I usually work on stretch paper. I have pre-prepared this sample. So this has been painted just like we did with sample number one. You can use any colors for this. We're going to layer them up. So bear in mind that whatever color you put underneath, obviously it's going to mix with the colors you put on top. All you need to remember in terms of a rule is that the first color needs to be fairly light. So don't go dark with your first color. Still got little pieces of salt here. What we need now is some masking tape. I've actually stuck this on my trousers to pick up some lint because we don't want it to be too sticky. And what we're gonna do now is tear it into shapes. And I particularly want torn edges because they're going to allow the paint to seep partially underneath and make interesting shapes. Now I'm just going to use random shapes here, but I have used this in the past to make actual things appear in the background. If you've got something like, you know, some maybe some tulips or some snowdrops, I did it with snowdrops once. And of course you can do it with, uh, with white paper as well, but it does tend to look better with at least a little bit of color. Or if you want the idea of some leaf shapes, but you don't want them to be you know, as fully formed as perhaps the ones in the foreground, it really is possible to get kind of an impression of things going on behind. But in this case, I'm just going to do some abstract shapes so you can just see how it looks. Let's do one more up the top. This masking tape is quite thin, but you can actually get the... Uh, the wider stuff, you know, about five centimeters or two inches wide. If you're doing a bigger painting, that'll give you more options for tearing. Actually, let's make that in two pieces there. Now, bear in mind that the first layer of paint is bone dry. You mustn't do this on damp paper. I also haven't stuck them down too firmly because we don't want them to tear the paper later on. And we're going to allow the paint to partially seep underneath. And what we'll get is some really interesting shapes appearing. So all we need to do now is go on top with darker colors. You don't have to avoid the tape. Let's go in with some purplish colors. Now you'll see the yellow is muting the purple there. So it's worth having a think about what will happen to the colors when you place them on the paper. Now, sometimes the paint will just go under the edges of the masking tape. Other times it might seep right underneath in places but try not to panic, it's just such an interesting effect. You know, just let it do what it wants to. Now, unlike the salt technique, you can remove 
I say partially dry, but when it's dry enough that you don't really see much paint movement anymore, it is safe to remove it then, but you will need to be careful. You don't want the paint to smudge. When you come to remove the masking tape, the easiest way to pick it up is to get a little craft knife, a little scalpel blade, and just use that to pick up the edge. You also want to remove the tape at a very low angle. In other words, hold it close and pull it horizontally. The more you pull things upwards at you know a 90 degree angle to your paper, the more likelihood that it will tear your paper. So pull it off slowly, as horizontal to the paper as you can, and you should have no problems. Just gonna pop a bit more dark over here. I'm going to let it dry and then remove the masking tape and show you what it looks like. Now be aware in this video, I'm not painting right to the edge of these samples, which would look nicer, but I don't really want paint all over my drawing board. At least no more paint than has already got on it. So here's the result and this has actually dried overnight. I'm going to get the tip of my knife and pull the last one off. And I think you can see the potential of this beautiful, interesting technique. For number eight, we're going to do a sort of shiny, soft focus background. And we're going to use something called gum arabic. Now gum arabic is a natural substance, comes from the acacia tree, and it's actually probably in your watercolors. It's a natural glue, an adhesive, and it also slows down drying time for watercolors. So we can get a really unusual looking soft focus background, maybe even some brush strokes that look a lot more like acrylics or oils than watercolor. Gum arabic is cheaply purchased in a little bottle or sometimes in powder form. Let me show you how this background is done. So I've got some gum arabic here. If there's strange things like paint appearing on my board, it's because I'm filming several videos today and also filming things a bit out of order. So this is some Jackman's gum arabic. This one needed a little bit of a shake up. Sometimes they, um, they separate, especially if they haven't got sort of too many preservatives and things in. And you'll see it's kind of a sticky liquid. So what it does is it slows down drying time. Now, I have got a little water and even, I think, a little paint on my brush. So it's water soluble. We can add a little water to it. I wouldn't use it completely neat. We're just gonna pop some on the paper like that. What I'm going to do now is start painting. And you'll notice that it has a different quality to just painting with watercolor. It's gone kind of smeary and see-through. Let's add I think this is a little black actually. Let's add a little black in. Let's make this one a bit more muted and interesting. Now it dries much more slowly and so we can manipulate it. Let's put a little purple in I think. And you see how we can almost get brush marks in it which is something that you can't normally do with watercolour. So we can get some really interesting effects here. Now I actually usually use gum arabic for painting water and the reason is that you can get reflections in it. So if you've got something like a river and you've got tons of things reflected and you think how on earth am I going to keep this water wet while I paint all of that stuff that I can see, I'm just adding a bit of water in here to my paper. Well, the answer is gum arabic. And not only that, but it dries shiny. So if you want kind of a watery or perhaps sort of an ethereal effect, then you'll find it dries, unlike gouache, which dries actually very chalky and matte, this actually dries quite shiny. So we can get some really interesting effects. I'm just playing around with colors here. I've also used it in the background of portraits where I want to get almost like the impression of an oil painted background. I did it when I was painting a geisha lady. I'll try and find a picture of that one and pop it up for you. And so you see, I'm only dipping into it occasionally. You don't need much. Now, when I say it slows drying time, it's not something I would encourage you to just randomly put in all of your watercolors because it does change the way the paint applies. But for certain special effects like water, or if you want to get those little brush marks going on, many mediums use brush marks as an attractive part of the painting, but it's not something that we can generally do in watercolor unless we use some gum arabic. Let's let it dry and see how it looks. 
So here's our gum arabic background. Now it's very very hard to show that anything on camera is shiny at all. I can assure you that this does have a shine to it but I wouldn't be surprised if the camera's not picking that up. It's the same with anything like iridescent paint. I have a terrible job getting it to show on camera but I think you can see these brush marks that you can get. You simply can't get this effect usually with watercolour unless you're doing something like a brush stroke on a white background, it's not going to show because everything would just run together. This is a great medium, not only for backgrounds, but also for making water because the natural shine makes it look wet. Number nine is a background that I need to do more often because every time I do it, I absolutely love it. The effects are really, really unusual. They can mimic things like real things like plaster walls and rocks. You can also use it as just an abstract background. You're not gonna to have to worry about drawing lines because we're going to positively encourage them. We're going to be using cling film, maybe called something like saran wrap or plastic wrap in other countries. You'll recognize it as soon as you see it. So here's my cling film or plastic food wrap. Now, like most people, I don't use as much of this stuff as I used to for environmental reasons. But remember, when you're using it for crafts like this, there's nothing to stop you rinsing and drying it. You know, you can use it several times and we're going to use very tiny amounts. So let's pull some pieces off just because this is a small sample. Now, like any other texture technique, what I want to do is use a variety of bright colors and I also want where possible to use some granulating colors so let's move those ready over to the side let's go in with some of these nice bright colors let's get something that granulates a little more now just like the salt you need to apply this when the paint's very wet so we're going to do it in stages so let's put some on this side first all you're going to do is press it down and we'll leave it alone as we continue to paint round and we'll pop some more on. Now the effects you get with this, they're just so unusual and they're unlike, you know, anything that you could paint. They, the only thing they remind me of actually, the only thing I've seen like them in life is if you ever get those fossilized rocks where you see sort of um, animals and things and plants that have been trapped in the rocks. I think this technique looks a lot like that. So again, I'm just going to pop some here. Let's go around a little further up the top. Forgive my messy painting. Not only can I not turn my paper, I can't lean my head forward because it would um, get in the way of the camera. And I'm extremely short-sighted. So um, I don't know about you, but I ideally would like to place my face about an inch from the paper. Seems to be the, uh, the way of things. Now I'm a little older. I mean, I'm only 25, but you know, I, th I think it comes to us all in the end, doesn't it? Let's go here. I may have reversed those numbers um, and, and subtracted a few as well, but uh, I'm sure you'll forgive me. Okay, so I'm gonna give it a final press down. Try not to move it around too much. And now we're going to let it dry. Just like the salt, this is going to take a significant amount of time because it's trapping the moisture underneath. So don't pull it off too early. So here's our cling film results. I'm just taking the cling film off now. This has dried overnight, so you really need to give it a good amount of time because the plastic does inhibit the drying. And look at that, I've never seen results like this. You, you couldn't do this with a brush. It just looks amazing. I think it looks like some kind of uh, alien rock. It often reminds me of fossils. And I have used it successfully to give the look of a sort of rough plaster background because you can somewhat control the marks you get by either scrunching it tightly or leaving it a little looser so you just get one or two folds. Lastly, I'm going to show you how to do a flat wash in watercolour. Yes, it is possible to get a flat wash behind complex objects. Now, I do deep dive into this particular technique a lot more in my beginner's watercolour course. In fact, it's the first technique that we practice. We practice it alone. We practice it around a background of complex shapes because being able to do a flat wash is really a basic of watercolour. It seems so simple, but it's one of the hardest things to do. So I'm gonna give you a few tips and hints today, but do check out my complete watercolour beginners course. I'll leave a link in the description of this video. So let's do our flat wash now. 
So let's try a flat wash. Now, the first thing to do is make sure you've got enough paint mixed up. The little well in your palette is going to be too small, so stick it in something else. And you want to use as large a paintbrush as possible. And if there's room, use a flat brush. Now, one thing that I would do with a subject like this is I'd probably divide it into smaller areas or at least have it going off at the bottom, which most subjects would. But let's make it hard for ourselves. And we're going to go all the way round. So we need to paint quickly and evenly. I'm going to go in two directions at once here. I'm allowing myself to go off the edge of the paper because it's more important to spread evenly. Now I've got a little splatter has gone into my heart there. Don't even worry about things like that. Certainly don't try and clean them up because they'll come off when they're dry. And I've got other videos that will show you how to remove things like that from your paper. Now, all you need to do here is make sure that you're spreading quickly and evenly and that the whole thing has the same amount of water on. And you want to avoid there being any areas that are too wet. We're popping it on and then we are leaving it alone. Now, if you've got an area that's much larger than this and you need to get all the way across, you don't actually have to keep the whole thing wet at once. You only have to keep the leading edge wet. As I said, this is one of the techniques that I deep dive in on my basic techniques for beginners watercolor course. Have a look in the video description if you're interested in that one. I'm going to move this very carefully, keeping it flat, and we'll see how it dries. So here's my flat wash sample. It's dried nice and flat and even. We did have a little splatter here. That tends to happen when you're using very watery, very wet paint. It's nothing that I would worry about. I can either lift it out with a small piece of damp cotton wool or gauze, or I can just leave it there and imagine that when I painted the center, it would just blend in. Really happy with the evenness of this result. So do let me know in the comments which one of these techniques you like the best. Do you use any of these techniques already or have I shown you some new ones that you'd like to try? And before you leave this video, don't forget to have a look in the video description. There's all sorts of free stuff down there for you. You've got some free downloadable PDFs. There's even some courses that you can take for no money whatsoever. You'll also find details of all my paid courses. They all have five star reviews and many hundreds of people have taken them with great results. And you can also watch another one of my watercolor techniques videos right now.